welcome to the first installment of the Linux seminar series. Um, graciously funded by the generous support of Martha, David, and Bagby Linux Foundation. Uh, our first seminar speaker is Crystal Glan Glanchai from, uh, from uh, Venture Lab. She's the CEO and founder um, of the local organization here in San Antonio that teaches uh, young girls about coding and science and technology uh, outside of the classroom. Uh, Crystal has a strong background in creativity, innovation, design, and entrepreneurship as uh, she was the director for the Center of Entrepreneurship and Innovation here at Trinity University before founding and before founding Adventure, Adventure Lab. <laughs> Uh, tonight she'll be talking about um, entrepreneurship and teaching girls to stand up and start up, uh, closing the gender gap in tech and entrepreneurship. So after biomedical engineering, I started learning about entrepreneurship. 
internship. I took some business classes. I took the course on technology commercialization. So I started to think, you know, technology is great, but unless we apply this technology to the societal need, what's the point? We really need to benefit society with what we're creating. So I started a company called Manifest. So my PhD had been in um, making disease responsive, nan disease responsive nanoparticles that could selectively target tumor tissues. And I went around doing business plan competitions and eventually doing, doing investor pitches. And I really noticed a lack of women CEOs and a lack of women venture capitalists. So this kind of led me to ask the question, where are all the women tech? Where are all the women CEOs out there? And I started to think, Remember in my experiences in technology and entrepreneurship, many times I felt like an outlier. I had, and maybe actually you can just imagine yourself. Imagine maybe this is your daughter or your sister or your mom, and she's starting her first day at work. And she's super excited. She's meeting all her colleagues. She sits down at the table, and her colleague across the desk says, no offense, but you're a young girl, and I don't think you can do this job. I mean, wow, <laughs> welcome, thank you. No, I mean, what century are we in? I mean, this just happened, this is an experience that I had a few years ago, and it just really affects women's um, confidence in themselves. And so, this is something that I don't expose my kids to. I have four kids, so two five-year-olds, two girls, and a five-year-old, eight-year-old boy. And I want them to have the confidence to believe that they can be astronauts, that they can be engineers, they can be scientists. I want them to have the confidence that they can do whatever they want to do. So currently, although the interest in STEM right now is increasing, there's a widening gender gap between men and women. So actually, the number of women and girls interested in STEM is staying constant while more boys are are getting into well. So this isn't necessarily a good thing. And also, only 20% of girls are pursuing engineering and computer science degrees. And in the field of STEM, there are actually only about 25% of women in STEM fields. Now looking at tech and entrepreneurship, only 10% of Fortune 500 companies have female CEOs. And at tech startups, it's only 5%. So there's really a gap here. And a lot of this is due to that negative stereotyping, that lack of confidence and that lack of female mentors. But I think it starts at an earlier age. It starts when girls are in elementary school. So from this graph, you can see in elementary school, 74% of girls say they're interested in STEM. They like science, they like math, they're interested in pursuing these fields. But somewhere around middle school and high school, this drastically cuts off and by college, only 14% of girls are interested in pursuing the STEM fields. And so what does this do to This is due to early social cues. You know, girls, gender roles that they see at home, cultural iconography, or gender bias in the classroom can all affect young girls at this age. Girls are given a certain path. They go down a certain pathway when they're getting Barbies, or when they see boy heroes or science wizards. Um, can anyone here off the top of their head name um, a lead female role in a cartoon. Wonder Woman. Who? Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman is. Uh, I don't know if she should be dressed that way. I don't know if I'm a regular girl. Uh, a lot of people say Powerpuff Girls. But even Powerpuff Girls, I don't know if you know the premise of the whole thing. They were made by an evil scientist using sugar and spice and everything else nice to create these perfect girls. And all of a sudden they were exposed to something called Chemical X, which you know gave them superpowers. And of course you have these huge doe eyes and it looks super cute. Anyway, I don't know if it's really a role model that I want my girls looking like too. <laughs> so what I really want to do is give girls confidence to stand up and to start up. I want to give them role models and icons that they can see. They want them to see women in science and women in technology. Oops. And this is why I just started Venture Lab. So my mission was with Venture Lab was to create the next gen the generation of innovators and entrepreneurs, inspiring them through curriculum, inspiration, and mentorship. 
My goals were really to decrease the gender gap. I mean, that was my big goal. I really wanted to increase the number of women in STEM and leadership in entrepreneurial roles. But also, I wanted to make it accessible to all students because I think all students need STEM and entrepreneurship education. So some of the key skills that I think girls, and of course all kids need, the entrepreneurial mindset, so being determined, not being afraid to try and fail, seeking out opportunities and problem solving, creativity, teamwork, public speaking, leadership, technology. So all of these things I think are really critical. So how do we and how do you inspire girls to get the confidence to pursue these careers? First and foremost, let's not put their wings. Let's give them the confidence and self-esteem to believe that they can do anything. Let's set them up with role models, expose them to role models who have been successful in entrepreneurship or technology. And really, this is a really big concept here, so rethinking failure and taking a risk. Many girls see themselves, so an example, um, I knew a girl in computer science, and she really wanted to code, that was her passion. Um, but unfortunately, the first time she got a C in her computer science class, she told me that she didn't think she was good enough and she changed majors. So this was her own belief that she didn't have the potential to learn that and to continue on with that degree. So I want to teach girls to rethink failure. Failure is learning either what not to do or you learn to seek out resources to help you. It's a learning process. It doesn't define you as a person as being a failure. And then taking a risk, you really need to go out there and stretch yourselves. Um, try something new. And if it doesn't work, if you fail, then no big deal. You try something else. So just getting girls that concept. And here's another thing. So you're not always going to be an immediate expert in what you do. So a photographer will have to take hundreds of photos just to get that one really great shot. Um, the photographer, um, or let's see, Thomas Edison had to fail, had to get a team, and he had to fail tons and tons of times before he actually invented the light bulb. So it's kind of that whole concept of effort and risk and failure. And then we need to teach girls to be passionate, to be persistent, and to be positive. I really want them to think that they can do anything. So we also need to think, we need them to think about observing, always asking questions, experimenting, and creating. These are concepts that are really critical for technology and entrepreneurship. So, oh, I don't know why that's up there. But we need to demystify science and technology for them. So do some simple experiments with them at home. These are things that I do with my kid. You know, take everyday items around your house. Um, what do I have here? Goldfish, cheese, strawberries, and test the pH. See if they're acidic, see if they're not. Um, I did an experiment with two potatoes and two wires where I made a radio play. I mean, these are, these are just simple things you can do at home that show kids and girls how fun science is. Let them build Legos. I'm a statue of a one and a half year old daughter at the time at the Lego Museum in Washington, D.C. These are all things that get them to create and build and think and problem solve. Teach them Tinkercad, which is a free software available to anyone. Teach them 3D modeling. Teach them about 3D printing. Teach them to create websites using Wix or Tap. Some really cool toys that I like for kids are Arduino, Little Bits, Ruminate, and Minecraft. These are all things that really get kids thinking and building. But one of the most important things is getting girls to think like an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs anticipate needs. They take risks. They look for opportunities. They problem solve. So, one thing you can do with your daughters is ask them what problems are around them and how can they solve those problems. So this is an example of Adventure Lab, a group of girls. We asked this one five-year-old girl what problem she was having. And so this is a five-year-old. So she said she always got in trouble for eating her Play-Doh. So we brainstormed with her. Okay, so how can we change this? How can we make it so you don't get in trouble for eating your Play-Doh? So she came up with the idea of edible Play-Doh. The idea was that if it was made out of food, she wouldn't get in trouble for eating it. <laughs> so we went along with this. The student went around with her team and did some market research. So they went to all the other girls in the room and they asked, you know, what's your gender, what's your age, what's your favorite color, what's your favorite flavor. They tallied up the results and they came up, I think it was, one was pink strawberry and one was chocolate peanut butter. So we went to the store, made the ingredients, 
know, mixed it up, packaged it, and then we asked the students, okay, well, how much are you going to sell it for and what's your company name? So they came up with the idea of Tasty Meal. So we took pictures of their products and made a website with them. And at the end of the week, when they went to sell and pitch their idea, each of the kids walked away with $20. And these are five-year-olds that, you know, otherwise would be sitting at home just watching cartoons. So this is just really something fun, you know, letting kids explore their ideas fully and take, it, take ideas all the way to reality. And so ask your kids, what if, get them to think, what if they could do something that they, they didn't think they could do? So a little cute example, another five-year-old, their idea was they didn't like broccoli. So what if they could make a machine that turned broccoli into puppies? <laughs> so I mean, I know this is a silly idea, and it's probably not possible, but it's a great way to get them thinking and brainstorming and ideating, and it can lead to some really good discussions. So ask your daughters, what if? So get them to brainstorm, write out their ideas. Get them to design a prototype, whether it's just a paper prototype, drawn on paper, or even using a 3D printer. Get them to do market research, actually push them to go out and ask people if this is some sort of product that they would want. And then have them build their product. So these girls actually made customized flip-flops, and they actually sold out really quickly. And then have them think about how much they would sell it for. How much would pe people will be willing to buy it for? You know, ask your parents, ask your neighbors. And then have them pitch their products. It's really important for them to know how to sell themselves and sell their products. So whether you know it's a PowerPoint presentation with the older kids or just you know something like a science fair type demonstration. And then have them sell. This is always their funnest part. They get to sell what they made. Um, and I'd say almost every student who left made somewhere between twenty and forty dollars at the end of the week. So that's a lot of a lot of kids wanting to buy lots of candy. So I really feel like we're helping make a difference by decreasing the gender gap. We've taught about seven hundred twenty-four students. About sixty-seven percent of them have been female. Um, we've had three companies formed, two hundred forty thousand raised. We had an at-risk student receive a full scholarship to college, and the students are telling us that they feel more confident. So I just want to give you some real examples here. So this really shows a girl using her creativity and ideation and taking it to a finished concept. So this girl was really into fashion, but she also really loved mystery and detective novels. So her idea was to create this bow tie headband where she could have a secret compartment to store hidden notes. So she drew it out, and here's her little compartment right here. She figured out how much it would cost to buy all the components to make her bed again. Then she actually 3D printed the component and hid it from inside the bow tie. And so you can see right here, the students up here pitching their idea. And yeah, so their bow ties sold out immediately. I bought them too. Was, I mean, they were super cute. You couldn't even see the little compartments. But that's just the idea and the creativity that these kids can have. And they're actually making these products. Um, another example, this is kind of an example of persistence and being passionate. So we had a 13 year old who was really passionate about obesity and getting kids to exercise and be fit. So she came up with an idea for an app that the more you walk, so it was basically um, a pedometer, pedometer that worked with Bluetooth on your phone. So the more you walk, the more points you get in her game. And she went through our course and about a year later, we introduced her to a network of mentors, entrepreneurs, app developers, she was able to launch her app, a beta of her app, and she actually raised about 200,000 for me. And you actually can't see this very well, but we worked with a group of economically disadvantaged girls from here in San Antonio, and we asked them what sort of problems they were having. And they came up to us with everything from brushing their teeth, to getting their lunch, to making it to school in time, to taking care of their kids. When they first came to the program, they were physically hunched over. And when they talked, they would actually cover their faces with a piece of paper. And they were very wary of all the other students. But we really made sure that we created a safe environment that was fear free. There was no fear of failure. They knew they could just say what if and just imagine whatever they wanted. So the girls, who initially had been completely different than I described, completely blossomed. Their ideas, out of the 40, their ideas were chosen to pursue. 
and they ended up presenting in front of the whole group. So um, one of these girls in particular, about a year later, she became a keynote speaker at a gala, and she actually just received a full scholarship to go to college. So just seeing the act of teaching these girls about entrepreneurship and technology and seeing how much it changed. She initially had wanted to, she thought she would maybe be a housekeeper or work at a restaurant. And now she's going to college and she wants to start her own business. So you really see the effect that this has on people. And so what I wanted to do today with my talk was just to inspire everyone. I want us to go out and teach our daughters, inspire them to stand up and to start up. I really want us to give our girls the confidence that they can do technology and entrepreneurship, make it fun, make them go through this process, and hopefully we can develop the next generation of women innovators and entrepreneurs that will be able to solve the 21st century's grand challenges. Thank you. So we get donations to cover scholarship seats for kids that can't afford them. Hi, so I know that you said it's really important for the girls to have a mentor, and you were lucky in the fact that your dad kind of supported you. Did you have anyone else that you looked up to as you were getting into the field? Yeah, I'd say a couple times. In grad school, I had a professor that really encouraged me to start my company. He's the one that taught me about technology commercialization. Um, but then also, when I was running my company, Nanotaxi, I joined a group called Springboard, which is a women's uh, CEO group. And there's also groups called Golden Seeds, that's a women's angel investing group. So there are, all, there are women uh, groups out there that, that are really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you talked about um, when you went into college for Japan engineering, you were like one of four but you still said that you felt very confident. But was there ever a time when you kind of felt dissuaded from joining such a male-oriented field? Um, I think there were many times that I felt dissuaded. Um, but I just, I think it, it was the, the values that my, my father instilled in me that I just never wanted to get up, give up because that's what I was passionate about. But I would say, yeah, there were tons of times I felt dissuaded. Thinking back to those times, what advice would you give a young woman who didn't have the support like your father gave you or didn't have that background? And like, what advice would you give them to overcome? Um, well, I mean, I think, I think there was a small sweet group. So um, I, did, I did do the Society of Women Engineers. And then maybe if there is a female faculty member, um, you know, working with them, maybe as a TA. Um, and just, I'd say always keeping kind of that positive mindset. Um, because I have some sort of background with your lab, I know you guys are trying to sell curriculum and in a class student are talking about how getting computer science and like tech into education. How do you think that adding entrepreneurship into education systems worldwide or US specifically would help girls specifically get into tech and entrepreneurship? So that's, that's an interesting question. So there's a lot of STEM out there right now. So the thing that I think is really important is entrepreneurship as well as the arts. I think with entrepreneurship and arts, entrepreneurship encompasses the tech. It encompasses design. So you have to come up with an idea or a product, and then you have to design it. You have to design a website. Um, there's so much art involved in that, and I just think that whole process can be a lot more appealing to girls. And it's something that can be layered on top of anything. So say you're interested in social studies. Well, you can develop an entrepreneurial process where you look at some sort of new product that can help that specific area. Or computer science, like you were saying, you can come up with a new game, do game design. It just really fits into any, 
I'd say, in the subject. So one of the things that you talked about was trying to kind of promote this environment where it's OK to fail. Yeah. But it seems like for either you, know, especially starting in middle school and getting older, mm -hmm. failure is like the worst thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of promote those ideas, especially when people leave your program, that they still have this idea that mm -hmm. it's OK to fail in my 20s in a yeah. really critical time? Well, so it's interesting that you brought that up because um, when I taught here, all my classes, the first thing I said and was on my syllabus was that I expected my students to fail. So the first day of class, I told them I expect you to fail. And so I think by kind of saying that out front, it lets you know that there's wiggle room, that you're going to learn from your failures. Because in particular, in entrepreneurship, it's not like math. You know, two plus two is four. In entrepreneurship, it's very gray. Even the professor doesn't even know if your product will work, if there's a market for it, if there's customers. So I just think. You know, if you're lucky enough to have a professor so that, that up front says it's okay to fail, but I think just kind of keeping that mindset that, you know, yes, I may fail, but I'll go get a tutor to help me. Or maybe I just have a different way of learning. So I think it's just keeping kind of that mindset of failure isn't necessarily failure. Failure it just means you're learning something. So maybe go home and try this or try this. So we've been giving them kind of activity books with suggested guidelines. You had mentioned the lack of female lead roles in cartoons and children's programming. As a mother, are there any TV programs that you do let your kids watch or that you're happy to let them watch? Well, yeah. Um, I really like the Mason Bird. I know it doesn't have any women role models. <laughs> Um, I'm close to liking, um, is it Johnny Test? Do you guys know that one? Mm -hmm. Because he does have the two sisters that are like scientists, but of course they're not the lead, it's Johnny Test. Um, but I mean, those are the kinds of the cartoons that I like, or that my kids like. Um, do you think that women in science and tech are supported in other parts of the world more than in the US? So, you know, some of the Asian countries seem to really support their women. Yeah, I actually, I don't know anything about that, so I wouldn't be able to comment. Um, but it does seem that way. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. This is a question, but um, it's a comment, it's a reinforcement, I guess. <laughs> the, uh, you, you know as well as anybody, you know better than I, you know, all the different reasons that people come up with why, why girls uh, avoid computer science in particular and may apply to all STEM. But of all the myriad reasons for, for, for that phenomenon, I'm really glad you picked the one to talk about, which is the, the lower uh, tolerance that, that girls seem to have for, for failure or for poor grades or whatever. Um, as a teacher here at Trinity, I've seen that over and over again. And my favorite example, just to give an anecdote, is um, there was a gal a number of years ago who was getting a C in one of my classes in computer science. She was also my advisee, so she came and said that she was switching majors. We had a long conversation. She was doing well in all her other computing classes. This one was a very different sort of class. It wasn't all that indicative of what she could do. So, after talking about it, she decided to stay. Well, we have an award for the graduating senior, the best senior uh, student graduating, 
I'd love to say that the punchline of the story is that she won that, but she was number two. <laughs> and I think that kind of goes back to the, the gender roles that are observed at home or the iconography. It's, and just even like with the powder puff girls, girls are supposed to be perfect girls that are you know, full of sugar and spice and everything nice. It's, it's kind of the perception that girls are supposed to be, you're not supposed to play in the mud, you're just supposed to kind of, I don't know, stay in your bodies. Yeah, I meant to say too that when I read about that, that uh, you know, typical guy's attitude, they get a C or D in the class, is, oh crap, I got a C or a D. Oh well, maybe I'll do better next time. <laughs> but with a gal, it oftentimes is kind of a crushing blow. Yeah. You know. And actually, that reminds me of a really interesting um, kind of anecdote as well, kind of how girls don't see themselves as being experts. So this actually happened a couple, I think it was about two years ago. I was going to an entrepreneurship conference with a male student of mine. And this was an entrepreneurship conference, and I've been teaching this for, I don't know, four or five years. And so right when we got to the conference, they asked us to choose name tags. We had to choose if you were novice, average, or expert. And so I got there, and I'm like, well, you know, I think I'm just average. And my student, who had just only taken my entrepreneurship classes, he's like, oh, no, 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 we're experts. So he grabbed the expert tag, and I grabbed it too. And we went into the conference, and, you know, to my surprise, we were experts. And so ever since then, I have never question my expertise on anything. But it just goes to show that that kind of belief that women have that, you know, even if you are an expert, you're not necessarily an expert. So it's interesting. You've mentioned a lot of the trends and like statistics um, for women in the, in the um, like computer science field, but do you see those numbers going up in the coming years? Like let's say 10 years from now, do you think oh, yeah. there'll be substantial difference? Yeah, I mean there's much more initiatives for girls in STEM. Um, entrepreneurship, on the other hand, is very new, but I'm hoping that we're going to be the, the thought leaders on that, so I, I see it coming up in both, in both realms. Great. And my follow-up question is, how closely um, related do you think the like, entrepreneurship and technology are going to be in the future? Like, are they hand-in-hand, um, hand? or like, if our girls are really passionate about like, technology and coding, let's say, how like, aware of entrepreneurship should you be? Well, I actually think everyone needs to be aware of entrepreneurship um, because I think a lot of, you know, a lot of times people go, go to school and they learn to be great coders. But then when you graduate, you really have to know how the real world works, working in teams, how businesses work. So I actually think it's really important that every student understands a little bit of entrepreneurship. Because also, you know, say you graduate and you don't have a job, you, you then have those skill sets to figure out how to either make your own job or find a job. I was trying to remember who asked the first question. I remember when I taught at Trinity, I used to give a dollar to the first person asked the question. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I'm, I'm always scared. <laughs> Even when I, I mean, the thing is, you're always scared, but you do it anyway. Um, I'd say the thing that keeps me from the real world consequences is that I always have a backup plan. So when I was starting Nano Taxi, I had my backup plan was to become a professor. Um, when you know, with Venture Lab right now, I've got two other backup plans. You know, should should I run out of funding, or should you know my next sale not come through? You know, kind of my business plans of how I'm going to keep the business running, but then say that shouldn't, you know, that comes to the worst, I have plans of what I'll do next. One, for one thing, and I have experienced this too, a 
a lot of times um, working moms. So I had a job once and I, I became pregnant and had to go on maternity leave. And when I got back, I was told I had to fight for my position. Um, that in itself is not, it's not a friendly environment to come to. So for me in particular, I think, you know, tech companies need to be a lot more flexible with women and moms in particular. Um, you know, usually it's us moms who are worrying about the kids and taking them to and from school. So we really need that flexibility. Um, and I know a lot of tech companies expect you to be working 60, 80 hours a week. Um, but that in a way is, it's already um, biasing against women. So I, I think that just shouldn't be the standard. They shouldn't. I don't even know how to solve the problem, but I just think they need to think about it differently. So have you seen any changes on the venture capital side, uh, people opening up more to women making the pitch? Um, not necessarily. Those numbers are actually still really, really low. I think um, only about 6.5% of um, women-led startups, tech startups, are, have VC funding. Um, so I think that along with all the, everything else here, it's still very low. I haven't really seen a large change. Thank you very much. 